Let's turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4 through 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4 through 6. Thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> I've had the benefit of hearing this message once today already. I feel as though it's only appropriate on some level to uh, perhaps warn you <laughs> on some level. Uh, the message I feel is from the Lord. I encourage you not to shoot the messenger. Uh, it is meant, I think, to stir you some and to challenge you, maybe shake you just a bit. This message is medicinal in many ways. For some of you, it will be preventative. For others of you, restorative. And for others of you, healing will take place. To some of you, this message will seem unusually intense, potent, maybe strong. I make no apologies for that if that's in case, the case with you. It is meant to be. It's not as strong as the word, but there's much of the word in it. It's in keeping with truth. I strongly recommend listening not only to this one time, but perhaps two. I think the end goal of this message in part is deep conviction. This came out of uh, a preparation, um, as would any sermon, but it also came out of a phone call that I had of, of late. A phone call with a gentleman who is a believer, who is and has been uh, struggling with a sin that so easily besets him for decades. It's one thing to be in bondage to a particular sin before you come to Christ, and then to be set free. It's yet another to be in Christ and have to deal with an ongoing sin that so easily entangles you. It's complicated at that point. It fosters a sense of frustration and shame, a sense of defeat, and if lingered and not set free, on some level, a sense of acceptance, maybe even becoming a part of one's identity. And this is not good. This one phone call grieved me because I sense the frustration of this man's repeated attempts to break free but to no lasting avail. It grieves me more to know that this particular phone call is representative of many others. And on one hand, we have the power of God and the, the intensity of the Spirit of God, and on the other hand, we have this repetitive, even redundant sort of failure after success after failure. For some of us, it's an addiction of some kind. For others of us, it's food-related, emotional-related. It doesn't matter what it is. The fact is, there are many in the body of Christ today that are struggling to overcome sin that so easily entangles them, and they need a word. They need something to break them out of that pattern. For what is happening at present isn't effective enough. So therein lies the purpose of this message. As I said, for some of you, it'll be preventative. For, for others of you, convicting. For others of you, restorative. And for some of you, you'll be healed this morning. There's three things I ask of the Lord. Four things, actually, I ask of him. When I stand up here. One is salvation for those who do not know Jesus Christ. The second is provision for those who are in times of lack. The third is deliverance, freedom. And the last is healing for our minds and our bodies. The text this morning is a, is a verse that I have preached on sometimes two times a year, maybe more. 
because it is one of the verses in the Bible that means the most to me. If I was to have a personal verse, it would be Philippians 3.10, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. If it's the verse for ministry, it would be this one. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 5. I say this in the context of a church in the West here in the United States, and I quote an Iranian Christian woman from the movie I've asked you to, to watch, Sheep Among Wolves. Here in the United States, this Iranian woman who believes and follows Christ says this, there's a satanic lullaby here and all the Christians are sleepy and I'm feeling sleepy. To her husband, she says, will you please take me back to Iran? Uh, I, appeal, I appeal to the words of Christ and for Christ to speak through me this morning at a level that is necessary to free some of you from this repetitive, redundant bondage. That Christ would be compassionate with you, but he would also speak as a revolutionary. For that's many, in many respects, what his ministry was, one of a revolution. A revolution against darkness, against sin, against disease, against maladies, against corruption, against bondage. I would also say this, as Thanksgiving approaches, I've had the privilege of ministering to you during times, relatively speaking, of lack. When there wasn't that much business and the economy wasn't that great, relatively speaking. And now I speak to you in a time of plenty and abundance and busyness and productivity. A word of warning, my friend. Your gratitude in today's season of abundance needs to exceed the level of your desperation during times of lack. Also, I called the dentist the other day. I have to have some work done. And called to make an appointment and they said, I think we can fit you in, in late January. Let's make sure that we're not so busy, that we have difficulty fitting the Lord in till January. Now let's look at the text. For we know, brothers and sisters loved by God, uh, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. I have a question for you this morning as I conclude this series, Religion Versus the Gospel. What gospel are you living? What gospel are you living? What, what gospel gets you up in the morning and gets you focused on innovation, creativity, mission, purpose, drive? What gospel invigorates you, emboldens you when you get up in the morning to meet the demands of a day, but to be a witness of that gospel no matter what happens, good, bad, or indifferent? What gospel are you living? Not what gospel of rhetoric do you have, not what recipe do you have to, what formula do you have to lead someone to Christ? No, no, no. What gospel is driving you? What gospel is moving you? What gospel is filling you? What gospel is bringing you joy? What gospel is liberating others through you? What gospel is that? Because Paul said, our gospel came to you not simply with words. Our gospel came to you not simply with words. The gospel that we live by, that we swear by, that we move in with the power of the Spirit of God, that gospel that I'm talking about, that the Word of God is talking about, that gospel has a demonstration to it. It has a visibility to it. It's beyond rhetoric. It's beyond words. It's beyond motivational speeches. It's beyond preaching. There is an activation. There is a practicality to this gospel that is visible to others, that is different, that is recognizable, 
that is substantial, that is tangible, that is measurable, that is repeatable. This gospel changes the world with action. Not rhetoric, not preaching, but preaching and rhetoric backed up with words, with actions, with deeds, with gifts, generosity. Mid 80s, I sold cars for a season. I sold cars because I didn't study enough and I drank plenty enough. It was a way to work, it was a way to get a, make a living. I was good at it. Nobody bought a car from me until they let me demonstrate that car to them. Nobody got in the car until I put them in the car. No one drove the car until I told them they could drive the car. I shut that front door, I shut the car on the driver's side of that car and I started at the left corner panel, the front left fender and I took them around, I talked about the tires, the warranty, the safety bumper, the, the engine that drops beneath their feet on head-on collision, the accessibility of the maintenance under the hood. I talked to them about the power, the engine, the gas mileage. I talked to them about all the safety features. I talked about the look at the car, the maintenance, the expense of repair. I talked to them about the insurance costs or the insurance savings. I walked them around that car until they got to the driver's side and they knew as much about that car as most anybody that made it. I could do all of that in about seven to 10 minutes. This is back when people had an attention span. I'd put them in that car and get them comfortable and I'd talk about it and I told them where to drive around the block. I'd close deal after deal after deal, high gross deals. I'd close other people's deals because I demonstrated what it was I wanted somebody, you'll laugh now, at the time to pay $20,000 for. People were averaging $1,000 a minute with me. Give me 20 minutes, they'd buy the car for 20,000. I demonstrated the car. No one else demonstrated the car. No one, spend that, no one spends that amount of money without driving the car, without knowing about it. They say, they make up a reason for not buying it, but it's because you didn't demonstrate the automobile. Christianity is no different. It can't simply be words. It has to be a demonstration. It has to be a gospel that is visible and demonstrable and practical and applicable and repeatable and measurable. What gospel is driving you? Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated his own love for us, well, for us while we were yet sinners, he died for us. We serve and worship a God who demonstrates love, demonstrates patience, demonstrates compassion, demonstrates wisdom, epitomizes everything he says to do and walks it out. Our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with with power. The thing I haven't figured out, not sure I ever will, the thing that frustrates me the most as a pastor is this very phone call. It baffles me. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I don't, I don't know how to go about it, but I know that there is a power. And is it accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week? And it is a power greater than our level of self-discipline, greater than our self-control, greater than our own appetites, greater than any distraction. It is a power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead, that navigated and brought him up, blew into the sails of Jesus Christ and raised him out of the depths of darkness into the light, with a new life, a new resurrected life. I know that power exists, but what, what baffles me most, what frustrates me most, what angers me most is this power does not link up with those who are in bondage. When those two things meet, there's freedom. When they don't, at best, a commingling of the flesh and the spirit. One phone call. It probably represents 100 people in this room. Rhetoric regarding the power lyrics about the power, but not the manifestation of the power, not the internalization of the power, not the access to the power, not the mingling with the power, not the power of Christ, the resurrection power to overcome strongholds. This irritates me to no end. 
This is a gospel that's demonstrated not simply with words, but with power, power, power. Many people are living apart from this power. As if there isn't any at all. Defining what it means to walk with Christ and live a life sporadic with the power of God. What gospel is driving you? What gospel feeds you, nourishes you? What gospel gets you out of bed? What gospel sets the course for your thoughts for the day? Because this gospel, their gospel, wasn't just words. It was with power, power. I see people living so far beneath the potential for lack of access to the power of God. It changes the human mind, attitude, actions, thoughts, habits. It dissolves and dilutes and desecrates mediocrity, averageness. What is unusual about your walk? What is notable? What is distinguishable between your walk and the rest of the world? What is it? What is the distinctive? What is unique? What is consecrated? What is special? What is only can be seen in you, not those without Christ? What is the differential between those two things? Where do those two realities collide? What gospel is driving you? What is your approach to life? What do you want? What are you doing? It's power. Sometimes this power is talked about in some historic context as though it was something from yesteryear, some notable thing on a documentary, some 2,000 year, year ago experience or reality. No, no, sir. No, no, ma'am. It, it is reality today, this power of which I speak. You gotta teach in the power, you gotta preach in the power, you gotta worship in the power, you gotta live in the power, you gotta build a home in the power, you gotta renovate in the power, you gotta sell a property in the power. The power of God, what gospel drives you each and every day? Our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power and with the Holy Spirit. What? I thought the Holy Spirit was power. Oh, he is. Oh, he is. But he manages that power. He counsels you how to use it. He, he gifts you. He delegates. He checks you. He convicts you. He told you to wait. He tells you to go. He tells you it's going to be okay. He tells you to speak. He tells you to not speak. He inhabits your speech. Yes, this power is raw, and we don't know how to use it. We don't have a navigator. We don't know how to manage it. We don't know how to steward it. But the Spirit of God, the great counselor, oh, no, no. He helps us navigate, speak, minister, counsel, encourage, correct, rebuke, preach, teach. No, no, the Spirit of God will teach us how to love, how to be patient, how to forgive, how to have love, joy, and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Yes, the Spirit of God counseling and stewarding that raw power, resurrection power of God is a gospel that should drive each and every human being. But we're becoming accepting of our own sin that so easily entangles us. It's becoming part of our identity. There's a sweet spiritual lullaby in this country. Slowly and methodically wooing us into some deep trance of acceptability, of living at such a low calling, such a low standard. So as not to disrupt the apple cart, so as not to convict others of their sin, so as not to differentiate us from anybody else. Oh, this sweet lullaby. Where the Holy Spirit is, there your thoughts are. There your wants are, there your agenda is, there your appetites are. That's where your gifts are. That's where freedom is. Are you living expectant and dependent? Or are you living indifferent and independent? What's your spiritual walk look like? Is it in need of a, perhaps an adjustment? 
in this time of plenty, you need some tweaking. In the early days, my wife and I, we didn't have the nicest furniture and we darn sure didn't have the nicest rugs. <laughs> we would change the furniture in the room. That's how we got it. We didn't go out to rooms to go. We went to the room and changed the furniture. It's much more economical. That was the newness that we created on our budget. You walked into a few chairs and you hit a few sofas in the middle of the night, but at the end of the day, it kind of gave you this sense that we're making some sort of progress in this house. <laughs> when furniture needs to be moved in your walk, you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you're getting. You know, if Jesus Christ is everything we say he is, and he was everything that we say he is last year, and we served him in the same manner, shouldn't this year we have discovered something new about him, something vibrant, something life-changing and transformative, and shouldn't next year be a little bit different than that? But yet we go about the same process each year in and year out. We go about it with the same size shovel, the same hoe, the same garden tools, to mine the riches of Christ, hoping to find out more. But no, you can only put so much dirt in the same size shovel. I'm looking for someone to say, I need a bulldozer to discover what Christ is like next year. I need to tweak my walk. I need to move the furniture. I need to expect greater things from him. How can we dare insult him by expecting the same things of him year in and year out when he's... In infinitely beyond our imagination. Who's even using your imagination? What gospel drives you? Is it full of imagination and curiosity and expectation? Or is it the same gospel from last year with the same devotion, the same this and the same that? And for those of you in bondage, you're gonna get the same results. Who needs to come into your life? Who needs to get out of your life? Something's got to change. Some of you are accepting this sin in your life. Something's got to change. What is continually repetitive, predictable, lame, and ineffective? If you had a business, you'd be looking at innovative, creative ways of doing this, that, and the other thing. But yet your spiritual walk doesn't get that kind of planning, that strategic evaluation, that sort of, it doesn't lay out that way for some reason. We just accept we're going to try to do a little Devo every now and again, go to church. Everything's going to be all right. You're right. All right. You're right. All right. It's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. Is that what you want? I want a gospel that drives this church to excellence. I want an astounding witness from this church. I want this church to set a model how to reach people with the gospel around the world. I want to ask for things I can't even imagine and forgive, ask for forgiveness when I do just imagine. Gospel's driving you. What power's at work? How's that power being stewarded by the Spirit of God? We can ill afford to make the most important relationship of our life. Have no creativity, no creative, no creative thought put toward it. No pen to paper. No consideration of something beyond where we're at. Just sort of take what comes. Whatever crumb falls beneath the table, we'll pick up and be happy we have it. We come to church every Sunday next year. Or However, we come with the same expectations. We'll continue to talk about our nation and its problems, but we'll talk about that far more than we'll cry out to God in fasting for revival. Because some of these things are just out of our control. Have you been lulled into accepting such a low level? Spiritual effectiveness, I hope not. Our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, the Holy Spirit. 
and deep conviction. Deep conviction seems like a stress now again. In, in, in 2019, deep conviction is a stretch because conviction really is a more realistic goal. If we could just get conviction, like conviction in all its glory, conviction is a beautiful thing. It, conviction of our sin, fine, it draws us near to God. A sensitivity to the sin, I'd be happy with that. No, 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 that's not what it says. He says, this gospel that drives me, it, Paul says, drives us, our gospel, this gospel that drives us has a deep conviction to it. Wait a minute. A deep conviction probably exceeds a deep longing for the very sin in our life. I bet you it does. Deep conviction. Not conviction, deep conviction. A Nehemiah-like conviction. That causes a man to confess his sin and the sins of his nation. And pushes, plate away, and fast and pray cry before God. It's a deep conviction. It says our gospel can be not simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. <laughs> kind of kind of gospel is stirring you and moving you. Because if it's this gospel, this biblical gospel, there's an occasional reality of a deep conviction. Said another way, an absence of depth lends itself to an absence of the fullness of the gospel of which he speaks. It's an unselfish conviction. It's a burden that we carry for other people more so than ourselves. It's a Christ-like conviction. It's a sacrificial conviction. It's a put others first conviction. It's a, it's a gospel that's visibly demonstrating a sacrificial prayer, sacrificial longing to see people come to Christ, that deep conviction. Yeah, it's a Nehemiah-like conviction. It's a Davidic conviction. It makes a man look straight in the face of his adultery and murder, conspiracy to commit murder. It forces a man to look right at it, to, to look right at it, to look right at God confess a sin for which there was no sacrifice. A Nehemiah type conviction, a Davidic conviction, a messianic like conviction it causes and prompts a man to look at the skyline of a city and begin to weep. Rather than point out faults or anything negative or how inefficient things are, the messianic type deep conviction. You don't have to talk much. Everyone else is saying the same thing. Why join in? This type of conviction stirs you to weep and cry and believe by faith. That the opportunity may present itself, that the gospel would drive you to demonstrate one opportunity, if not today, tomorrow, this one opportunity which to look another man, another woman, a child in the eye and share the demonstrable gospel of Jesus Christ, which would be the pinnacle of your year, by the way. Not your bank account. The opportunity to look another human being in the eye and change the course of their life for eternity. That's, that's still important, isn't it? That kind of conviction that makes us more God-conscious than self-conscious. Where we have a greater fear of God than we do man. Our gospel came to you not simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit. And deep conviction. Look at your walk. Listen closely, is there a lullaby playing in the background? And is it slowly easing you into this deceptively blissful acceptance of where you are, where you're not, where the world is and where it's not? Wake up. Wake up. This gospel that drives you drives you upward, outward. 
It's a gospel that drives you in such a way that you cannot be in bondage to any sin. It's not allowed. It drives out such nonsense. It's so unnecessary. We get in these situations where this sin comes in our life and we can't shed it, we can't break it. We, we do for a season, then it comes back. Then we go and then it comes back and then we go and then it comes back. Our antidote to such things, our antidote, is not simply to share our problem with everyone. I guess that has its place, but that's simply words. That's simply words. Say them often enough and we begin to accept them as our own identity. Who is that guy? That's the guy that shares his problem all the time. We need a demonstration. Something has to change. The furniture has to move. Or we'll get the same result. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you welcome the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. I warned you. Calling on your life that's beyond rhetoric. It's substantial. It's ill-advised to do the same thing over and over and expect different results. Something has to change. I don't go into a lot of detail about the sin. It's hard to figure out what it is. It's riddling the church. It's attacking the church. It's deluding the church. Somebody needs to stand up, turn the lullaby off. It's not acceptable. Let's figure it out together. Best of intentions aren't what we need to applaud. Christ is who we need to applaud. Post-deliverance. Enough. Enough. I would hate to follow this message. <laughs> Let's pray. I've heard it said, Father, even here today, that the things that are above our head are beneath your feet. What of the sin that so easily entangles us, Father? What about that which causes us to not even be differentiated from the world? Is it not right to ask for deep conviction? Is that not right? Is that available? Is that power available to set the captives free? It transcends a song or a message. It becomes an intimate reality in a man and woman's life. went about preaching and teaching the good news of the gospel and healing every disease and sickness among your people. You were anointed to preach good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, set the captives free. If there's anyone here today, Father, that is not free, from you in any gospel. I ask you to snatch them from the fire even now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, how about it? Maybe you're here today and you never accepted Jesus Christ. What gospel, you say? What good news? What freedom? What victory? What are you talking about? talking about a 
man or a woman, surrendering their life to the Lordship of Christ and accepting the payment of a debt you cannot pay, never could pay, never will pay, the debt of sin. That God came in the form of a man to represent you and die on a cross for the very sin in your life. Known and unknown. And by accepting that gift on the cross, that death, he buried your sin and separated from the Father as far as the east is from the west, that you can walk worthy of the calling he's placed before you because you're forgiven. Though your sin was like crimson, it shall be whiter than snow. When you first accept him, I don't even know how to explain it. It's like a weight come off of you, and it was the weight of guilt and sin and condemnation. It was never meant to be there in his economy, but he'll take it from you. And that may be all you have to give him is your sin. He'll take it just to get to you. Failure to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior is to work out your own salvation and your own form of forgiveness. I'll save you some time. It ain't going to happen. But there is a newness of life. A newness of purpose and resolve. A lightheartedness and a joy. A laughter that's available to you that comes from the throne of grace. Grace is what you're given that you don't deserve. And with it comes mercy, the withholding of what you do deserve. A new relationship with Jesus Christ to start your life all over. It's the greatest redo ever. If you never accepted him, I want to invite you to do so today. I want you to take that seriously when I say I just want you to raise your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm going to pray for you. In a very elementary way, I'm going to pray a way for you to, in your own heart, accept him for who he says he is. Does anybody here need to accept Christ? And be born again. All right, let's get down to the business at hand. For this, I'll not ask you to raise your hand. I'm going to ask you as your friend and as your pastor and as a brother. Something has to change if you're continually overcoming the same thing. How about a once and for all deliverance? Seek out counsel. Come out from the darkness. And let's put something together that is different than what hasn't worked. This gospel of which I speak is not simply words, but it comes to you with power, the Holy Spirit. 